I'm going to talk to you about Unicode, and we're going to go down the rabbit hole. Uh, I've made all the slides indicate what year we're on, because Unicode is across a couple of millennia, so it's probably a good idea to keep track of what year we're in for any given information. Some things might not apply yet because they haven't been invented. So right now we're in 2019. We're going to talk about why I'm giving this talk, because why me? Then we're going to talk about the written word, the computerized word. Somebody invented Unicode for a reason, so we'll talk about that. We'll go into C++ and Unicode and how much that actually means, how much it works, how much it doesn't work, what kind of stuff we're going to do. And then we're going to talk about the future perfect, which is, of course, where we're going. So let's get started with why I'm doing this. So way back, we're in 1994. I'm a small kid in, a, in primary school. I'm learning German for the first time. And they have all weird words. So I figured I'll make a computer program because that's just who I am. Uh, I'll make it ask me a question, say if it says the word ampel, which is a uh, traffic light, I'll reply in the Dutch word stoplicht, and then vice versa. That's a good idea. And I had a friend who's actually German, who has a keyboard that has all the characters on it, and we figured, well, we'll try this, we'll make it work. So we programmed it in GW Basic because 94, and we tried it, and it sucked. Because I had leading spaces, that meant that if you accidentally typed a space in front of your word, it said, nope, you got it wrong. If you had a trailing space, nope, you got it wrong. If you made a case difference, you got it wrong. And then I tried to run it at home, and I figured out that I couldn't even answer half the questions because there were accents on the letters. And my keyboard doesn't have those letters, so I can't even type the answer, even if I know it. So, yeah, it works on his computer, but it doesn't even work on mine. I can't even try it myself. Okay, so let's skip ahead a bit. And let's talk about yak shaving. <laughs> Who's ever heard of yak shaving? Okay, so some of you will have heard the story, some of you will have not. What is yak shaving? Yak shaving is doing a series of tasks which are nested inside other tasks that you think are accomplishing a goal, and every task seems to follow on the previous one, but in the end you're doing something completely unconnected to what you're trying to do. So the colloquial story starts that I want to wax my car. But in order to wax my car, I need to fix my hose. So I'll go to Home Depot and buy a new hose. But the Home Depot is on the other side of the Tappan Zee Bridge, and I need their, an easy pass to get there. So I'll borrow the one from my neighbor. That's, that's still sort of reasonable at this point. But Bob is angry with me because I borrowed his mushy pillow. And he, do, he was not going to lend me that thing unless I return that pillow. But the pillow I can't return because some of the stuffing fell out. And I can't just give it back half empty. And it's a yak hair pillow. So I need to get some yak hair to fill the pillow so I can give him that, get my easy pass, his easy pass, go across the bridge, go to Home Depot, buy a, uh, a length of tube, and wax the car. So now I'm at the zoo. I'm shaving a yak so that I can wax my car. So that's roughly how I work. <laughs> so let's go into what I did. So I had a miniature train set, and I wanted to make a control system for it, but not just one with buttons, physical things. I mean, this is like uh, 2000 at this point. I have a computer. It has a nice display. It has a parallel port. I can use that to control things. I want a nice screen. I want it to look nice. So I need to have some UI system to display all my nice UI things. I need to edit the track in real time on display, rotate things around, but I'm not going to make this on DOS, uh, definitely not Windows. And, okay, I'll, just, I'll, I'll go make an operating system. <laughs> so we'll go deep into making an operating system, and three years later, I'm a moderator at osdev.org. Okay, I may have gotten a bit far. Made most of an operating system kernel called Atlantis West. You can still find it online on SourceForge because GitHub didn't exist yet, uh, even though I think I did put it on GitHub by now. And at that point, I sort of start entering corporate life, 2006, have less time to work on it, so sort of stop working on this. But at that point, I start working on my corporate code base, and I get entangled in strings, because we have a code base that has 26 string classes, a couple UTF-8, UTF-16, a couple company-specific ones, a whole lot of transcoding from back and forth and translating to things, things in your locale, which is platform-specific stuff that you really don't want to get into, but we will, don't worry. Um, so I'm back into Unicode, and I figured, well, actually, I'd like to pick up my operating system project again. 
But while doing that at work, I realized, why is there so little C++ support for Unicode in 2012? I mean, this is, this is starting to get ridiculous. We couldn't use C++ 11 because, of course, you can't use it the year after it's released. It takes at least like half a decade <laughs> in companies. Uh, but even if we could, it wouldn't have had much. It would have had a UTF-16 string and a UTF-32 string, but no methods of getting data in or out of it other than some methods, but nothing nice and nothing useful. So, yeah. Okay, so we get back to operating system development. Still a moderator. It's 2016 at this point, so that's like a decade and a half. And I restart my project. And I decide to rename it to, apologize for the butchering of your language, Rutten. Yes, this is a pure coincidence that I'm first presenting this at a conference in Norway. I did not intend it that way three years ago, but it just happens. So I try that, and I do that because it has an accented letter in it, which means that if I try to do Unicode, I must support Unicode, otherwise I can't even print its name. Okay, that works, got it working, it's working on a Raspberry Pi. I can boot it, I can have a login screen with a nice icon of a red wine glass. It says its own name, everything is Unicode, everything works up to a point. Because I'm still just printing letters. I'm not combining things, I'm not doing anything complicated, so Arabic doesn't work. Most people in the world wouldn't be able to use it because it just wouldn't work for them. And at that point, I go to a conference talking about something else, uh, a mocking framework in this case, and I meet two people from Carpet Spice. So Barbara Geller and uh, Ansel Sermersheim. And they tell me that they have the solution to string problems because they created CS string, which does all the things that I didn't do. And I figured, well, this sounds like a good idea. Maybe you should put this in standard C++. And they are like, sounds great, but we're doing Copper Spice. Would you mind taking this and sort of running with it to the standard committee and go and put it in there? Okay, of course, why not? I mean, let's go yak shave some more. So I joined the C++ standard committee, <laughs> joined SG16 specifically for Unicode, and start working out a, pro a proposal for strings, starting on CS string, expanding on it, create my own GitHub repository with some proposals, stuff in there that's probably going to enter the standard, hopefully in some years. So in 2018, we do that informally. 2019, I officially joined the C++ committee, so yay, committee member. We complete C++ 20, make sure that there's nothing in there that's gonna hamper us from getting proper string classes in. So we try to get rid of all the you know, standard specified ways of making crap language. And we try to make sure everything is supportable from that point on. Okay, so that basically brings us to just about now. And at this point, we're like four months ago. There's a new Raspberry Pi out. And unlike all the other ones before it, it has a documented USB uh, controller. So that was the thing holding me back. So I'm back up making an operating system again. Yay. So we're here about Unicode. So. This is why I'm doing Unicode. I've hit it like four or five times already. It's just gonna keep coming back until we solve it. So let's get to the history of the written word. Who can tell me what script this is? Hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs, yes. Egyptian hieroglyphs, used from the 32th century BC up until 394. And that number is because that's the last date that they found uh, something actually written in hieroglyphs, and they are pretty sure that it died out at that point, because after that point, nobody wrote it, and no, nothing could be found anymore. It uses three kinds of ways to use a letter. And originally, it started out by having just a literal meaning. So looking at these, who can tell me what these hieroglyphs mean? In case you're hesitant, they literally mean what they look like. So the first one is not the wheel, because that wasn't invented yet. 3200 BC, come on, it's the sun. The second one is a reed, and the third one is a mountain. So there we go, basic introduction to hieroglyphs. Then they move to having them as symbolic things. So they would be used as, uh, for example, a reed or a sun, but more in the symbolic meaning of light. And then they went to use them as a letter. So they started making series of, uh, of tokens in a row that meant some, some kind of word or concept that they didn't have something visual to ex express. For example, the color blue, unless you have blue paint, is really hard to express with, with symbols. So at that point, they were still mostly writing on stone or carving into stone. And these hieroglyphs are really complicated. So other languages will have more simple tokens than this. So let's go to the next one. Who knows what script this is? 
Chinese, I hear Chinese. Anybody else? Nobody else? Japanese. Japanese. Do we have a third option? Korean. Yes, Korean. Do we have a fourth option? Well, actually, this is a trick question because all of these are Chinese, but there's nothing about it that could tell you it's Chinese because there are four countries using the same script. So Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Taiwanese, and Hong Kong, and Vietnam. So there's a couple of people using the same kind of script, but the first people to use it, as far as I could find, was Chinese in 1200-ish BC. And we call these kinds of characters Han characters. So that's what the name comes from in Chinese, Han Zi, Han character. And every letter used to be a complete word. So you have monosyllabic words. It's just a single syllable for a word, a single letter. And at some point, they started transferring to uh, bisyllabic words, and that's still currently most of the Chinese words. They just have two symbols for them. And in this case, we have fairly recognizable symbols as well. Although I will admit that I forgot what the first one was. <laughs> Uh, it's not the letter. <laughs> it's 1200 BC. Books haven't been invented. So that's not it. The second one, though, that's a tree or wood, depending on which way you interpret it. So at some point, they start evolving to mon uh, polysyllabic words. So let's go to the next script. This is Hebrew. And Hebrew is interesting because on one hand, it's one of the very few languages that completely died out and then got back. It's also one of the very few languages written from right to left, which means that you start reading all the way on the right and then read to the left, go to the next line, and so on. I've had to remove the dot at the end of the last line because my editor would put it on the wrong side. <laughs> Yay, a bug in the presentation software. It's not the first. So we have Hebrew. It's interesting because it's right to left, but otherwise it's still just letters. And we still have just letters for alphabet. So this is the Hebrew Aleph, and this is the Hebrew Bet. So it's still just a language like Greek. But interestingly enough, it's older than Greek. So this started around 1000 BC, and Greek started around 800 BC, give or take like a century. And Greek is what we think the name alphabet came from. So we've had alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. We just took the first two bits, alphabet. So we have an alphabet. It's an adaptation of the Phoenician alphabet, which I'm not showing because it's not relevant to the rest and we don't have time. And it's evolved greatly during actual use. And here's a bit of an example of what Greek looks like, left to right, nice and easy to read. And they still have most of the letters that we nowadays use in, in uh, mathematics and in uh, physics. Yes, thank you. And then we go to the one script that I almost forgot to put in the talk, Latin. Because it seems so obvious, because we use it all day, and I just completely forgot to mention it. But that was invented after Greek, and it came from Greek through Etruscan to Latin. And Latin has just a number of letters. You have consonants, you have vowels, and a group of those forms a syllable. And how you pronounce these syllables differs greatly between everybody in a country, between countries, which means that if you have something written in Latin, there is no way of figuring out how to pronounce it, unlike a number of other scripts. But this does mean that most of the world nowadays has Latin scripts, which means that this is going to shape a whole lot of character encoding. But let's get back to what we had in the East, because we have Japanese. And Japanese call this kanji, uh, kanji, where kanji means Han characters. It's a slightly different pronunciation, but it's the same kind of thing. And it's actually the exact same character set as Chinese. But the Japanese didn't just write left to right like we expect. Initially, they wrote top to bottom, right to left, as in like this. If this reminds you of the matrix, that's for a really good reason, because the matrix scrolling text, that, that animation that most people seem to know, that's Japanese characters as well. And according to one source that I found, it's actually sushi recipes. <laughs> <laughs> so just in case you watch the matrix, go learn to make sushi. So to read this, you would start all the way on the right, read from top to bottom, and at the end of a sentence, you go back to the top and read the next sentence. And again, these are the complicated Hanji characters, uh, uh, Kanji in this case. 
So these are still fairly complicated to read. You need to learn thousands of letters to be able to read it. Uh, Japanese primary school will teach you about 1,800 to 2,000 just to be able to read basic text. And the total set is at least 50,000. So we have Japanese. And then we go to Arabic. We're doing this in chronological order. Japanese was eight, uh, 57 AD, now we're in 200. And it's a ligature-based language, which means that if I take a word, and I'm going to go all the way over here, if I take a word written in Arabic, and I believe this is the name of Arabic in Arabic, and I separate all the letters with a space, they change form. So in order to read this, you don't just need to read the letters, you need to understand how those letters combine into a ligature, which also means that if we try to render this, I can't just make a font with all the letters and print them after another and expect that to work and be readable, because it doesn't even look like it. Just as an example, this character corresponds to this character. And while you can recognize the top of it being over here, the bottom has just disappeared. So ligatures are a really complicated thing to deal with. But what if I tell you, you've been watching ligatures your whole life and never realized it? So let's have some ligatures. Can anybody spot them? You need to have pretty good eyes to see them because the font isn't that big. I've made it as big as the words would allow. But these are all ligatures in all of these words. So let's make them a bit bigger so we can see the difference. And you'll see that in these cases, the letters combine to make a single thing. And if you separate them, there is a trick in Unicode to do that. They will print as separate letters. You can see the difference. And as far as I can understand, this is done to make it slightly more readable, especially in the FI case. In many fonts, and not this one, in the FI ligature, the dot on the I would disappear because the bow of the F would uh, obscure its space and make it hard to read. So in that case, the ligature is used to make sure that you don't have a separate dot on the I so that you can read it more easily. Uh, incidentally, I found a second bug in the presentation software doing this because as soon as I typed these words and I tried to go with my cursor through them to insert the non break the zero width uh, non-joiner to make sure that they didn't join, I found out that the presentation software doesn't allow me to. By the time I type the word that is rendered with a ligature, it ignores uh, arrows to the left until it's gone past the entire ligature, just sort of keeping the cursor at the right. Second bug. I still need to report that one. So, ligatures. Uh, let's go to the next script. We need to do a, a few more before we go on. So we have Japanese, second time. We have hiragana. Somebody discovered that actually learning 2,000 letters is complicated and not practical, so they made a simplified kana letters. And it only has like 50 letters. It's way easier. And these are pretty close in alphabet because most of these correspond directly to a sound. Um, used, they used to have this as a handwriting, and that led to a number of different forms of each of the letters which meant that you could not read some of them because people used a, a style that you couldn't read. Think, for example, the Z that we currently have, where some people add a curl at the bottom. Unless you know that, you're not going to have an easy time reading that. And at some point, they decided this is a terrible idea. We need to standardize this. We take this set of letters. These are standard, and these are old. And they decided to call the new stuff hiragana, and the old stuff hentaigana. So you can still write it and read it. It's just a new name for the same characters that it used to be. And this is an example of the kind of letters you see. I'm pretty sure these are the ones used in the matrix. So then we go from Japan to, three guesses. Korea. Japan, again. Because Japan has a third character set. And it's called katakana. And katakana is not used for Japanese words. Katakana is a simplified way of writing down Japanese letters for foreign words. So we have katakana in katakana. And this is fairly readable. The thing is that if you take a foreign word, it doesn't necessarily translate easily. So I've taken my name and translated it to katakana. So this is p t r b n d l s. Except that you'll notice my name has an R and it has an L. 
And yes, it's a stereotype, but it's also actually in the language because these are the same letter. <laughs> Japanese only has one sound to represent this, and that means that they will have to represent it by the same character, which means that if they read the one on the left, nobody's going to notice that difference in my name anymore. It's just lost. So this is not lossless. So now we go to a very different kind of language, and one of the most special ones that I'm going to talk about, only for one reason, which is Irish Ogham. And this one's interesting because it's the only language that has a space that is not white space. If you want to write the white space, you have to write a dash. And that is because initially it was a language used on corners of stones, which meant that if you wanted to mark something on one side, you chopped out a bit of stone, the other side chopped out a bit of stone. But at no point is that edge going to disappear. So if you want a space, you just leave some stone edge there. But that means that if you try to transcribe that to some kind of written form, which people in the 17th century did when trying to decipher this, uh, this text, they had to use it like this. They have an indication on the left saying this is where the, the brick starts, the letters, and then an indication on the right saying this is where the brick ends. If you want to use a space, it has to be a line, otherwise it just doesn't make any sense. So there go our assumptions. White space is not always white space. So let's go to the next one. We go to Korea, because Korea also made a simplified alphabet. They used to use hanji, uh, hanja. Sorry about the mispronunciations, it's horrible. Um, and they tried to make a simplified alphabet. And they simplified it into simple characters like these. But when writing, they composed them into more complicated characters. So the first three combine into this character, and the second three combine into that one. Which means that if we want to print this, we need to have something shaping our text to make clear that these, this is how they combine. So again, another complication. And here's an example in Korean. We go back to kanji. Because right now we're in 1946, and something really important happened. And at this point, Japan decides to simplify their character set because all those old kanji, they were complicated for reasons that weren't applicable anymore. So they decided to replace some of the most complicated characters by new characters that are simpler. So they had the old characters, they called them kyujitai, and they replaced them with this newer character set called shinjitai, which basically means now you have the old writing and the new writing, which would be okay, until the Chinese did the same. And they simplified to jianhuazi, simplified Chinese which everybody in China, mainland, currently uses. But people in Taiwan and Hong Kong decided not to. So they still use the original one. Japan is onto their own system. China uses simplified Chinese, and it's a giant mess. So the People's Republic of China made this, and it's similar, but not the same as Japan. So we have, for example, this character, which means stack. And this is in the original Hanzi. It's also in what would be Kyujitai Kanji, except that Google Translate won't accept that anymore. If you try to put this in Japanese, it's just going to say, no idea what this is. If we take the Japanese one, it's the same character, except that they simplified the right side to only have three dashes and a single symbol. And then the Chinese came along and did the same thing, except they removed one more. <laughs> so they are not compatible anymore. And we'll get to that as soon as we get to the written word, because this leads to a giant conflict in Unicode. So let's exit the written word. We've had all the scripts. We need to go on to the computerized word. And we start back in 1963. It's a nice continuation. It's just three years later. And at this point, both ASCII and EBSDIC are both created. They're created in the same year. And ASCII is designed as a new encoding. It starts with all the letters in consecutive order. And it's a seven bit encoding, which means you only need seven bits to represent it, which means on your modem, you can get like 10% extra speed, which is important. If you only get like seven characters a second, now you get eight. That's a big difference. And EBSIDIG was designed to be eight bit and compatible with punch cards, which is also relevant because most people use punch cards. And to explain what I mean by compatible with punch cards and why that's a good thing, let me show you. So reading this, we get the numbers 1 through 9. Then we get the letters. So A through I, J through, I think, R. Yes, to R. And then over here, we skip one. We should have had 0 and 1 being punched out. But somebody realized that if you did that, you'd have a hole of two, one, uh, two holes next to each other. 
that weakens the card. So you can't do that. You'll have to skip one. So both in uppercase and lowercase epsodic, you skip one after your R, so you get an S that is one further than you thought it would be. And also, they're all in a block from 1 through 9, which means that 0 is not used, and A through F in hacks are not used, which means that if you look at this on a computer, it just looks like a mess. But if you look at it on a punch card, it makes a lot of sense. So this mostly died out after punch card died out, except at one company that's still using it in 2019. And of course, that's going to be relevant. <laughs> so we have uh, China. And China discovers we have computers. We want to be able to express ourselves. We want to be able to type our letters. So they took ASCII, extended it with a variable length multi-byte character set called GB2312. And GB stands for Hoya Biahusun, just national standard. So Chinese national standard, Chinese character set. We can encode Chinese, and this encodes about 7,000 letters. So it's not even covering all of it. At that point in time, America goes further, and we get ANSI. Who here has heard of the ANSI character set? That's about half the room. The big problem is that ANSI, the company, or the American National Standards Institute, actually has nothing to do with this, because this is code page 437 in DOS. Yeah, so this is usually referred to as extended ASCII, because it's like ASCII, but you know, extended. The bottom half of ASCII, it's code page 437 from DOS. And the top half was filled with a bunch of line drawing symbols with some things in math. Stuff that would be useful if you're an American. So that's fine until you go to Russia. And we get code page 866, which has the bottom half filled with ASCII, of course, and the top half filled with Cyrillic characters. Which is fine until you get to, you know, Europe because we need other characters. We need to be able to spell Bjorn. So we have code page 850, which is the bottom half is ASCII. The top half is line drawing and accented characters. Incompatible, because if we get some math from the US, now we're not going to be able to read it. And then we get to Windows. Just four years later, 1985, we get Windows code page 1252, which is bottom half is ASCII, yet again. Top half is text processor symbols, accented characters, and some other useful things, like the euro symbol, although the euro would be introduced like 20 years later. Which is fine, unless you are Adi, and you want to type Hebrew, because then you'd switch to code page 1255. Yeah, we could go on for quite a while more. Code page 1255 is the same thing again. Top half is, um, come on, is Hebrew. And incidentally, if you thought about ANSI, LaTeX calls Windows 1252 new ANSI, even though, of course, it's not ANSI either. So let's go for a standard. Instead of having all these Windows and DOS code pages by some company making them, let's go for a standard. ISO 8859, we have standardized 8-bit code pages, 15 of them. <laughs> and we can't mix them because there's no way to mix them or switch from them. So this doesn't actually help a lot. We're going to leave the West aside for a bit, and we're going to go back to China, because China figured out that our code page, our uh, set of uh, GB2312, is not enough. We only have 7,000 characters. We need like 23,000. So they took that, and they added a whole lot more, called it GBK. Not an official standard. But practically, Windows supports this, so yeah, it works for them. And this brings us to what happens if you read something in the wrong encoding. Because we have a lot of encodings at this point. We have some Chinese encodings that nobody else understands. What happens if you do the wrong thing? Well, then you get Mojibake. And Mojibake is basically, I took some text in one encoding. I didn't know the encoding. I just applied some encoding, and then it gave me something. So one of the most common ones we get nowadays is people sending you stuff in UTF-8, and you reading it in ISO 8859-1, the sort of standard accepted Latin 1 character set. Which, for example, means that if you're Billy O'Neill with an apostrophe, and you encoded that apostrophe as the nice slanted apostrophe in Unicode, you get called Billy something Neil. If you ever see that one, you now know what it was. And this is still a problem nowadays, because people get post addressed to, not entirely sure how to read that, so N three quarters IRY with an accent on it, N Plunkett, even though their name is just Noriam Plunkett. Yeah, so this is a new misspelling. Somebody did something wrong. And if you make your own computer programs, you'll get the same thing. 
So this is somebody trying to say hello, and it doesn't work at all because the wrong character set is used for displaying the result in 2019. Awesome. But sometimes people know that this happens. People understand that emoji bake happens. So at some point, somebody tried to send a letter to a friend. The friend typed her email address out, or her physical address, sent it by computer. Somebody received it. Noticed that there were some unrecognizable symbols. And figured, well, this must be Russian. The person is in Russia. So I guess I'll just take these things, write them on the letter. Send the letter. And then gets to the post office, and they receive this, which is literally written at Mojibake. And somebody at the post office was clever enough to realize this, look up the usual way that Mojibake happens with Russian people, reverse the process, write out the actual name above it, so if you can read Russia, this says Russia, and then deliver it to the correct address person, even though it was completely mangled. <laughs> yeah, so it can happen, but don't count on it, just try not to make this. So let's go to Unicode. Because Unicode was, at this point, invented. It's 1991, we've gone back just a little bit because Mojibake happens now. And Unicode was created to have a simple, reliable, workable world text encoding. Joe Becker. This, this sounds like a smart person, somebody who knows what he's doing, somebody who has everything under control and he's not likely to make some kind of obvious simple mistake. So I'll continue to quote. Unicode could be roughly described as wide body ASCII that's been stretched to 16 bits because in a properly engineered design, 16 bits is more than sufficient. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Um, yeah, so Unicode, it encodes graphemes rather than glyphs. This means that if you have a different way of writing a letter, it's still the same letter and they're not gonna allocate two spaces for it, they're just gonna use one. It's a wide body ASCII, which means it's just bigger and you use two bytes for everything was incorporated on the 3rd of January 1991. They published the first volume in October. So at that point, we have a problem. Because we want to encode all current languages in this. And we have Chinese, Japanese, Taiwan, Korea, all using a character set with like 30,000 letters. Now your mathematics is going to tell you that doesn't fit. So we have a 16-bit character set. GBK already has 21,886, and we have four of them to put in there. So that's 80,000. We only have 60,000. So we're going to tell basically everybody using these character sets that I'm sorry you deviated back in the 50s and 60s, but we're going to merge you back together. So this is referred to as Han unification. And it's a very contentious thing, because it also means that in some cases, you have different letters you have different ways of writing the letter, and there's no way in the text to figure out which one to use, which means that your, your text could come out unreadable just because your font is wrong. Most of them are fine, and some have different glyphs, and they now have the same grapheme. So if you look at an overview, you'll notice that most of these are the same across the row, except for tiny details. For example, this one. This one has an accent on the left, simplified Chinese. It has an accent connected to the rest in traditional Chinese. Same thing here. Korean simplified it the same way, and Japanese simplified it differently. But these are all the same Unicode code point. So if you have some text and your phone is set to Chinese, you cannot read this Japanese text that somebody uh, sent you. Which is very impractical if you're working in China with a Japanese company. Suddenly they send you text that you can't read as Japanese because it doesn't make any sense. That brings up the question, what actually is a character? So the one on the top you probably realize. This is an A and that's an A, but they're completely different. So the rationale is that because they are both an A and the difference is just stylistic, as in it's just a different rendering of an A, we call both of these an A and they map to the same code point. The second one is two Chinese characters. And in this case they decided actually the grapheme is different because it represents a different concept even though the glyphs are just about the same thing. So that's Han unification. And then we get to one of the newer atrocities committed in the landscape of characters. 
somebody invented a way to send smileys. <laughs> so we're talking about Microsoft in Outlook. So what happens if you type a smiley in Outlook in 94? That's going to make it into an actual smiley symbol. How does it do that? Because it doesn't have a font with emoji, because they're not invented yet. That's 97, we're in 92. So somebody made a font that has smileys and other nice things to show. So we have wingdings. And we have all sorts of nice things to put in our email. We can tell people that we opened the folder. We can tell people we're waiting on them. And we can send them a smiley, which is awesome. And if you look at how this is laid out, this is a space, which means that this is a row of numbers, and this is uppercase letters. So that's an A, that's a B, that's a C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Who's ever received an email where somebody typed a sentence ended with a capital J? <laughs> that's a smiley. <laughs> K-L. Has anybody ever seen an email with a capital L? Well, I had that one once. So these are just letters. And somebody on Windows says this must be rendered in wingdings. And as long as you have wingdings and your, your email client interprets it correctly, you will get a smiley and you'll be none the wiser. Outlook still does this. In 2019, when we have emoji, we've had them for like five to 10 years now. It still does this. That brings us to emoji. So emoji stands for E, picture, and moji, character, the picture message. And they're really popular because, come on, just look at them. <laughs> You've even got pillows sitting in a couch looking at you like that. It's just, I like them. They're awesome. And emoji allow you to do really complicated things. Because if we just take an emoji and then add a modifier to it, we can make it into a woman or a man, or we can make their skin color different. Or maybe we can add a thing called a zero width joiner to join up to emoji. So instead of having a man and a woman, you have a couple. Or we can go make an entire family and get their sexes correct so we can have two uh, women married with a son and a, boy, uh, a, a girl and a daughter. We can have a dark-skinned family. This is awesome. But emoji do have downsides because this is a nice way of using emoji. People use them for bad as well. So the first one is that this symbol is mostly replaced with a water gun. And I thought it was everything until I typed it and it shows up as an actual gun because everybody replaced it except Ubuntu. Oh well, a knife, a gun, and a bomb. Um, these are really well suitable for telling somebody um, what you're going to do to them. This is not a nice way to, to talk to people. But then you get to the next line and you're like, an aubergine and a peach. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain what people do with that. So yes, people do that, but yeah. There have actually been proposals in Unicode to change the standard representation of a peach so that it looks like, less like a butt. <laughs> Which was rejected because, come on, people. And at some point, somebody in India threatened to sue uh, WhatsApp because they allowed you to use the middle finger symbol which is inspiring hate, and that's something that's not allowed by Indian law, so they tried to sue them. So let's go to Unicode abuse, because this is fun. So we have Zalgotext. Has anybody seen Zalgotext? Yeah. So Zalgotext is made in order to make something look really distorted, and it's used uh, just by using Unicode. We take regular text, we add some combining diacritics. So add a dash to the L, add some things on top and below everybody else, then we add some tons more. Somebody has a bug in their rendering that's supposed to be over there. And then we add even more. So we mess up the entire string so that it's barely readable. You'll see the Zalgo text at the top right. And then we have this, which looked like a nice shruggy, somebody standing there like that. But actually, this is just Unicode. So this is a Macron a backslash, an underscore, open brace, Japanese, hiragana, closing brace, underscore, slash, Macron. So this is just nine Unicode characters in a row. And other than the hiragana character, you wouldn't have thought about this, but it just looks so much like a smiley that somebody decided, oh, I'll go make that. And then we get the worst of all, which is making things look upside down. 
So th when you read this upside down, it looks okay, because it doesn't look that terrible. But actually, all of these letters are just stolen from something else. So this N is actually a U. This U is actually an N. It's kind of odd. And some of these are from different scripts. Speaking of different scripts, there's a thing online where if you have a domain name, you can have them in your native language. And people started using that because we use imitation letters from a different script to resemble something. So keep your fingers crossed, we're going to try a live demo. So we have two apples. We're going to try to take our browser and go to Apple. There's nothing on the screen. Yes, I will. So we go to Apple. This is Apple. We know that. And then let me find the right slides. We're quite a way along, actually. That's good. So we go for the second row. And I'm pretty sure that nobody noticed the difference. So let's go to apple.com. Does this look like Apple? Yeah, that's Apple. This is obviously not Apple. And this is not me hacking my browser or anything. This is five Cyrillic letters. So the P is pronounced R, or R, and the other ones are also just Cyrillic letters, which means that my browser thinks this is just a Cyrillic word, and I'm trying to go to however you pronounce it. But for me, this looks like apple.com, so I'm not expecting this at all. And this was abused a lot for trying to hack people, but it appears that most things can't be spelled in just Cyrillics. So the only way to do this is to mix characters. So you have one Cyrillic and one Latin letter. And that doesn't happen in official domain names, which means that that one was flagged by browsers. And in that case, they will not display it as Cyrillic letters. They will just display the underlying puny coded name. So this is an issue, but it's not as much of an issue as it might seem. So the first one is actually Apple. The second one is Cyrillics. If you compare them, you can notice that this is just a pixel or two to the right. But that's about the only way I can see this. So then we go to encoding Unicode. Encoding is easy. We'll never need more than 65,000 characters. So we'll just put it in UCS2. We'll call that the 16-bit encoding. We'll just put everything in that. What if we need to make this ASCII compatible, like calling an operating system function that only does ASCII? Well, we'll create a, a UTF-8 uh, UTF and just put it in there. ASCII compatible, it doesn't have backslashes or anything. So anybody searching for backslashes is going to work just fine. This is awesome. But what if you want to email something? We'll put in a UTF-7, which is a MIME-compatible format for putting Unicode text in. OK, but how do we now recognize if we do UTF-8 rather than Latin 1 or Windows 1252? We'll just take a byte order mark, which is a character that has no meaning in UTF-8, and put it at the front. Because everybody knows it has no meaning, they'll just ignore it and have text read as UTF-8. Awesome, but kind of weird. But now we need more characters. OK, so let's take UCS2 and take some region of that that was reserved, use that for expanding into a larger set of characters, call the new encoding UTF-16, and tell people this is now the new encoding. And you will need to be using this. And switching to this from UCS2 is really easy, so no issues whatsoever. <clears throat> but what if it's brought to a computer with big Indian encoding? Well, we'll put a byte order mark to start. And we'll do big Indian UTF-16 and little Indian UTF-16. But now, now I can't just go over it like it's a byte array or a character array. Well, we'll make UTF-32. And yes, you get a byte order mark and big Indian, little Indian, all that stuff. But now, what if I want to be able to read a UTF-8 stream, one UTF-16 or UCS-2 code point at a time? What? Why would you do this? This doesn't make any sense. You, don't, you shouldn't read code units. You should read code points. And, OK, CSU8. We can do this. It's kind of insane. This is used by Java because for some reason they found this interesting. It does mean that if you're trying to decode UTF-8 to UTF-16 and go one code point at a time, you get to have an integer place to break at. OK, it's maybe a use. 
But now what if I take this and make that uh, transportable across a space that can also not handle nulls? So we can take some UTF-16, transcode it to bad UTF-8, and then add in null characters so that we can actually ship the null characters over a null terminated byte string interface. Yeah, that's Android. I don't exactly know why they want this. But Android does this. But what if I use EBSDIC? And you want to use Unicode. Well, switch. Stop using EBSDIC. <coughs> but of course, that's not the answer you get. We have UTF EBSDIC, which is a Unicode compatible and EBSDIC compatible encoding to get Unicode across an IBM system. <sighs> okay, this one's horrible. But what if I'm Chinese and I used to use GBK? We can't just switch everything from GBK to some kind of UTF encoding. People are not going to be able to understand it. We want something that's backwards compatible. Okay, so let's invent GB18030, which takes a one or two byte encoding for all the stuff that's in GBK, and then has a four byte encoding for everything that's actually in Unicode, minus all the things that are already in GBK. So encoding to this is an absolute nightmare. It requires like a couple of megabytes of lookup tables and is very slow, but it exists. Okay, so then how do we display this? Um, well, it's kind of easy. Just map a character to a glyph, calculate the position for your glyph, draw the glyph. Like, figure out there's a D, this size, the I comes after it, display the D, and so on. Just repeat. Unicode is different, because now we don't just have ASCII characters, we don't just have Latin 1 characters, Hebrew, which is the, the other way around, but otherwise still simple. We have combining diacritics. We can put a dot on an I. We can put a second dot on an I, or like five. We can have languages that are right to left. We can have cases where somebody quotes a Hebrew person in English, or somebody in, uh, in Israel quoting somebody in English, which means that you need to lay out that somehow that it's readable for people not used to this. Then we have Korean and Devaganari. Devanagari, yes, which is used in India. And those scripts combine characters into more complicated shapes, which means that if you want to write that, you need to have some kind of combining and shaping to make that happen, which is really complicated because A, you need to detect it, and then B, you need to display it. And then we get ligatures. And the Dutch, European ones, American ones, they're easy. But the Arabic ones, they are horribly complicated. So to do this, we decode Unicode code points we normalize the code points, so we have one representation for everything. We extract the grapheme clusters, so it's like combining characters and your actual character. We shape them to determine where they go, and then we render them where they should go. That's easy. So now we go to C++. Yeah, so C++ in 1989, we have no support whatsoever for Unicode because it wasn't invented. Unicode started in 91, so of course we don't have any support. Then we get to 98. We have standard string. We have standard wide string, which is the current locale, which may not actually be what you think it is. And wide characters are defined to be wide enough to hold any character in your encoding, which means that Windows chooses 16-bit because that's fine. It fits everything in UCS2. It didn't have a whole lot of handling for Unicode, and everything it did have come from C because we have white characters to multi-byte characters, multi-byte to white characters, we can go back and forth between the two. But there's not really a way to handle UTF-8 at all. So let's fast forward, you go to 2011, because it took that long to get a new standard. We have std U16 string and car16, which is actually UTF-16. Then we get U32 string and car32t. Apologies for the W. And that's the UTF-32 string. This looks fine, we have support. And we have std regex, which has no support whatsoever for Unicode. It doesn't even understand that if you have UTF-8, that two bytes behind each other might need to combine. It's, it's not even fixable. So std regex, if you want to do Unicode, is just broken. Don't use it. We are working on something new. And we don't have any UTF-8 character type or string type. Because we got 16 and 32, but for some reason we didn't get 8. Yeah, so let's fast forward to 2014, where we get absolutely nothing. It's just what we had in 2011, because this was a bug fix release, and this didn't do a whole lot for C++ in terms of strings. So 2017, we get study group 16 formed 
in late 2017. So it's not actually C17 anymore. And we get string literals. So we have a U8, a U, and a capital U for UTF-8, UTF-16, and UTF-32. Except that the UTF-8 one is just a character. But a character array might just be some local encoding. So it's kind of odd to have this. It doesn't make sense. We need to have a way to, to keep these two apart. So SG16 pushes to get some kind of 8-bit car type, maybe like car8t, you know? and then U8 string to make everything match up and logical. So yay, we get that. 2020, we will have a car 80, we will have a U8 string. It will be UTF-8. We changed U8 to be actually car 80 because, come on. And this is a breaking change, which means that if you used U8 up to this point, this may change the way your code works. It may break the compilation. But in, honestly, this is the only sane way to do this. And if we don't do it now, we're going to have to do something similar later. It's going to break even more. We did look how many people are using this. And in a code base of a couple hundred million lines, we found about 700-ish, most of which was in one project. So that's sort of acceptable. And we have uchar and U, uh, C uchar, which does multiply to U8 string, U16, and U32. So we can read UTF-8. It's great. It's only 2020, and we can even decode characters. Good job. But when we put it in a U8 string, we can't actually use it. Because if we have a std string, we can't construct it easily from multibind and white characters. It's a C function that we're using. And if we did, we can't put it to C out. Because if you try, it's just going to say, I can't print this. I can't put these in C out. But maybe that's just my problem trying to use C out, which is the single character output. Maybe we should use the white one. No. That just doesn't work. So we have the types, we can't really use them for a lot. It's kind of annoying. So where are we with displaying Unicode in C++? We can decode them. It's mostly not in C++, but we can sort of can do that. We can normalize them, but not in C++. We can extract graphemes, but not in C++. We can shape them using external libraries like Harfbuzz, and we can render them using external libraries like FreeType. And they will do part of this because otherwise they wouldn't be usable. But in order to edit stuff, we also need to do all the way up to this, which means we're kind of stuck. So let's go to our future perfect. C++ 20, we are going to lay the groundwork. So we take all the stuff that is actually horribly broken, and we try to fix it as much as we can. So U8 needs to produce char AT arrays. We need to have char ATs. We have a whole lot of detail fixes, like if you compile something on Windows with a character in it that is representable in the source encoding, but not the execution encoding, it's just happily going to produce Mojibake for you. It's perfectly fine doing that. And we're trying to push that in so that if you try to do that and your code would compile to just garbage, knowingly, that we tell the compiler to make an error out of it. Because it knows it's garbage. Don't compile that. And we make sure that we get references to the actual Unicode standard into the C++ standard so that the next generation we can just point to that every time we need it, instead of having to refer to it in 100 different papers. It's just saving a lot of work. So C++23. We need to get some text type. We have to be able to do code points, graphemes. We have to get some Unicode support into all the rest of the standard that needs it. So we have std regex. It can't be fixed. It's just impossible. But somebody else wrote a really good compile time regular expression. If you haven't seen her talk, go to her talk. And that's also telling myself, because I didn't go to her talk. It's going to be awesome, and it has Unicode support. As much as we can muster at this point is already in. It is slated to go into C++23 as a standard compile term regex, because somebody used the name regex. And it's going to have actual Unicode support. So you can check that something contains non-ASCII characters or something contains emoji. And we have a, a direction paper, which basically explains what kind of stuff we're going to do. So that's a link. Uh, if anybody's interested, I will send it around. So what else do we do? We make some guidelines. Like, when do you actually convert your data? And we try to get you to convert it as soon as possible. When you enter your program, change everything to UTF-8. All your internal logic will be UTF-8, and try to normalize it when you get to the border. But normalization is a bit more complicated, because if you paste two strings together, they need renormalizing to be in normal form again. So that is something we will have to support inside the program, but every bit of encoding, 
we hope that we can convince everybody to just use UTF-8 everywhere. And this is not something that SG16 came up with. There is a push globally about UTF-8 everywhere on utf8everywhere.org. <laughs> Seems obvious. And they basically explain why this is the only sane choice for the rest of the future and why we should try to do this as much as possible. And so far, I think about 97% of the internet is currently in UTF-8, so it looks to be going in this direction. The best thing we can do is go along with that. So then we have SG16. SG16 is trying to get there, but we have some challenges. If you have any questions about this stuff, please feel free to ask us on the mailing list. You can contact Tom Honerman directly. He is the chair of SG16. I've asked him specifically if it's fine to put his email address on slides that everybody's going to see. He's fine with that. So feel free to ask him any questions. So I leave you with this one question. Do you go down the rabbit hole or do you want to stay where you are? <laughs> <laughs> This was Unicode going down the rabbit hole. Thank you. <laughs>